Hey, welcome to the Chestnut Checkers Podcast, a podcast where it's not a game, or is it? Standing in the midst of a pandemic, making plans for when it's over. It got me feeling like a young boy, making plans for getting older, because the city's getting colder. It don't matter what the season is, especially if our leadership is treasonous. Not just in the White House, even in hip-hop, we got some cowards. Tearing down the very culture, giving them the power. House, corrupting our sons. I don't even know if this is a podcast. I mean, people have been asking for it, so I said, you know, let me just go ahead and try to put something together real quick. And, you know, if people respond to it, maybe this will turn into something. I don't know. Um... Got a couple issues that I've been I've been waiting uh, to speak on. Nothing too serious to start us off. Well, I guess it is kind of serious, but uh, we're, we're going somewhere. It's exercise and you know what I mean how we how we think. Uh, one of my good friends said, "Man, I, I like the way that you challenge us, not in uh, what we think, but how how we think, how to think." So that's kind of what what I'm gonna attempt to do here. And I figured I, I'd pick a a topic I've been wanting to speak on for about a year. Because I always see people making comments about this. And um, I guess it's kind of controversial. You know, you always hear uh, people talk about Planned Parenthood and Margaret Sanger and uh, the racist history and all that. And uh, I said, man, you know, uh, I'd like to just share some ideas that would help us to think about how we're thinking about it. And, uh, (laughs) you know, uh, I'm sure it'll be some interesting dialogue as we back and forth on this one. Something interesting happened July of 2020. It was sort of like a a weird convergence of conservatives and social justice. Like you don't, you don't really see those two coming together, but uh, the conservatives who have been pro-life in it for quite some time actually coalesced with uh, those uh, concerned about racial issues when they saw Planned Parenthood finally came out and said, yo, we're going to no longer carry the name of our founder, uh, Margaret Sanger, the name that has become infamous. Uh, they said we're, gonna, we're not going to have her name associated anymore. And both conservatives and blacks who, who had always read and, and, uh, and been told, yo, you know, she, she had racist aims. They all celebrated together like, yo, high five. Like, even though we don't normally get along, yeah, we finally won one. Um, <laughs> I was paying attention, like, man, what's really going on here? They released a statement talking about why. And and really what it boils down to was they said, hey, after about almost 100 years of uh, this organization, we can no longer stand behind what they said, the racist legacy of eugenics that's tied to the founder of the organization. And if you if you think about what they're really saying there, they really were not confessing that Margaret Sanger was racist, dealing with any of her comments, they just said, there's a racist legacy of eugenics and that's been tied to her and then tied to us, so we're dropping her name. But that was enough. I mean, for most people in the culture, it was like, hey, they admitted something, that's enough. But if you think about what was going on at that time, like why was that enough? Remember, this was in the wake of George Floyd's murder and the whole nation was sort of in an uproar looking for like all kinds of racial reckonings. Confederate flags were coming down. Confederate statues were coming down. Aunt Jemima put on white face or (laughs) bleached her skin or something. Aunt Jemima got a lot lighter. And so with all that going on, Planned Parenthood couldn't afford to withstand any longer the claims of, y'all got to do something. So they did what they could. They they fessed up to hmm, eugenics can have a racial undertone or overtone. She was associated with eugenics. Therefore, we're just not even going to fight anymore. Let's not even get into the nitty gritties of what she said or try to defend it. Let's just divorce ourselves from her and her name. And that'll be that. But that still was not enough for purists. People who said, hey, y'all are still in the black community aborting babies and y'all are still racist. So there still is a conversation to be had about, man, is there a point there? Is Planned Parenthood racist? was Margaret Sanger racist. I'd like to offer a different perspective on that. And I know you're probably sitting there waiting with tomatoes and rocks uh, ready to to throw. But pause, chill, ease up for a second. Let's think about this. This is chess, not checkers. Don't just make a move like, ah, we won. Nah, there's more going on here. 
And here's why this matters, especially for conservatives, especially for conservative Christians, people who claim to love the truth. What if it turns out that you've been enlisting a lie to help you proclaim your truth? So I'm not saying don't fight your fight. I'm not saying that you should be pro-abortion. I'm not, I'm not saying any of that. What I'm saying is what you're standing on to make these claims, especially some of the emotional appeals that you're making, are not on any good ground at all. So let's, let's look at history real quick and let's see if history agrees with the current claims that people are making about Planned Parenthood's racist ends. So you might know uh, historically that there was something called the Negro Project. This was part of Margaret Sanger's looking at how to get her message of birth control into African-American uh, hearts and minds. And so she had this thing called the Negro Project. Now, what's interesting is African-American leaders joined her in this Negro Project. You had people like uh, Adam Clayton Powell Jr., who was the uh, pastor of the Abyssinian Baptist Church in Harlem. You had people like uh, Mary McLeod Bethune, who was the founder for the National Council of Negro Women. And you got to ask yourself, like, do you know, do we know today better than they knew? Uh, did she fool them? Like, did she somehow trick them into supporting her, 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 her Negro project? Maybe she paid them off. Uh, you might also know uh, Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. in 1966, when he received uh, Planned Parenthood's uh, Human Rights Award. He said this in his speech, there's a striking kinship between our movement, meaning the civil rights movement, and Margaret Sanger's early efforts. Uh, King went on to say, Margaret Sanger back then had to commit what was called a crime in order to enrich humanity, but we look at her and honor her courage and vision. Now, wait, what was it that she was doing that was called a crime? Was she going around killing babies? No, she was advocating that women take control of their reproductive powers. Now you can argue with her aim, but King's point was she was a hero for the way that she stood up for women. Now, maybe you're saying she fooled King too, or paid him off, but that's not all. There are more historical figures that joined the Negro Project. One of my cultural heroes, the co-founder of the NAACP, W.E.B. Du Bois, actually strongly supported the Negro Project. In fact, it's a comment that Du Bois made in Margaret Sanger's Birth Control Review, a magazine that she published. Uh, this comment is often attributed to Sanger, but it was actually him who wrote it. When you hear it, you're like, Dad, that's kind of that's sketchy. But listen to what Du Bois said. The mass of ignorant Negroes breed carelessly and disastrously so that the increase among Negroes, even more than the increase among whites, is from that portion of the population least intelligent and fit and least able to rear their children properly. Okay, so Du Bois is not a racist. He is an African-American leader. Now, Du Bois was often called an elitist, and rightly so, if you think about his talented 10th concept. Uh, it's a little bugged out for Du Bois to think he knows best who's most fit and unfit among African Americans to reproduce. But being elitist is not the same thing as being racist. Those are two different issues. And so we might have problems with Du Bois saying that. We'd really have a problem if Margaret Sanger said it, but she didn't. Now, she did say something similar, but with a very distinct difference. Two months prior, in the April edition of the Birth Control Review, Margaret Sanger said, the United States should keep the doors of immigration closed to the entrance of certain aliens whose condition is known to be detrimental to the stamina of the race, such as feeble-minded, idiots, morons, the insane, syphilitic, epileptic, criminal, professional prostitutes, and others in this class barred by the immigration law of 1924. But notice what's missing in her list. There is nothing about race. Now I know somebody's sitting there saying, but what about that one quote though? You know that one quote. Yeah, there is that one quote, but even that one quote, it's like if you put it in context, you realize you are tripping if you try to make that into 
See, this is proof that she was a racist. You can find this quote in a number of places. Here it is in a USA Today article. This woman quotes it as if there's some kind of like evil genius plot being hatched here. She grabs these words all out of context and doesn't tell her readers what's really going on in this letter. So here you have Margaret Sanger trying to convince a doctor who's a supporter of her uh, birth control movement. She tells this doctor, we should get African-American ministers to help. But look at the way it's kind of grabbed here. Basically, get over your reluctance to hire a full-time Negro physician. Why? Because colored Negroes can get closer to their own members and more or less lay their cards on the table, which means their ignorance, superstitions, and doubt. Now, if you don't know the context, you're like, hmm, she says Negroes and calls them superstitious and we're going to hire one of them. And so you're just thinking something bad's happening here. But then you get to the next part and you're like, oh, yeah, it's really bad. It's even worse. The author of this piece compared Sanger back in those days to the abortion lobbyist today. Sanger urged Dr. Gamble to enlist the help of spiritual leaders to justify their deadly work, writing, we do not want the word to go out that we want to exterminate the Negro population. And the minister is the man who can straighten out that idea if it ever occurs to any of their more rebellious members. This sounds so dastardly. Aha, this is the smoking gun. We've got her. We've caught her. This is proof that she's out to exterminate the Negro race. But think about what's really going on here. Is she really saying to her white friend, let's hire black ministers and they'll help us keep our secret that we want to kill black people? Like, what are you saying about black ministers that you think that they're gullible enough to go along with this and help her trick black people into exterminating the race. Maybe something else is going on here. Now, when I first read this, I was working uh, for a pro-life organization in Philadelphia. We were going into the schools under a grant uh, from the George Bush administration back in 2007. And I read these words, they were sending us into, into the schools with these uh, pamphlets. And I said, yo, this is crazy. But I was also a Bible college student learning the art and science of interpretation, a.k.a. hermeneutics. So I said, before I go in here and expose her for the demon that she must be for making statements like this, let me find out what the context is just to make sure that I'm not demonizing someone. Well, when you put it in context, it changes everything. What Margaret Sanger really said is colored folk in the South are different than colored folk in the North. In the North, we had people like W.E.B. Du Bois able to appeal to African-Americans on an intellectual level. But in the South, Blacks are more superstitious. She says, while the colored Negroes have great respect for white doctors, they can get closer to their own members and more or less lay their cards on the table. This is where she's talking about their superstitions. They do not do this with the white people. And if we can train the Negro doctor at the clinic, he can go among them with enthusiasm and with knowledge, which I believe will have far reaching results. His work, in my opinion, should be entirely with the Negro profession and the nurses, hospitals, social workers, as well as the county's white doctors. Now, this is where the context really comes into play. His success will depend upon his personality and his training by us. The minister's work is also important, and also he should be trained, perhaps by the Federation, as to our ideals and the goals that we hope to reach. Think about that. If we train him in our ideals and the goals we hope to reach, not if we hide our ideals from him, not if we keep him in the dark about our goals, if we train him in our ideals and the goals we hope to reach, what will the result then be? Then the word will not go out that we're out to exterminate the Negro population. That's where she brings in this, we don't want the word to go out idea. We're used to hearing that in the context of don't let the cat out the bag or I've got a secret I don't want to get out. But she's not saying that. She's saying if we do the right thing, if we train the minister in what we truly believe, then no one out there will get the wrong idea thinking that we believe something that we don't. And yet the irony is 
decades later, that's all people think she means. Now, I still think it's a little wild that in her mind, the minister is the one to keep the rebellious ones from the population from trying to sniff out, hey, what y'all up to over there? But in this case, they weren't up to anything. Now, you can still refute that if you want, but now you can't go around acting like you don't really know what was happening in that letter that people are quoting and taking out of context. Now, just for a little more historical context, in the same year, she wrote a letter to another friend of hers talking about the need to support her work with African Americans in this outreach that she's providing to almost every other people group, be it natives, even women in the KKK, which I'm like, dang, okay, you was rocking with them too. But she's saying the same thing about the benefits of birth control to women in each of these groups. But think about what she says about African Americans and why it's so needed. She says, African Americans are notoriously underprivileged and handicapped to a large measure by a caste system that operates as an added weight upon their efforts to get a fair share of the better things in life. Now, you don't have to agree, but her worldview is that unplanned or poorly planned pregnancy puts children in the worst predicament and continues to enslave women. This is what drove most of what she did in her life. Now, was she a eugenicist? Most historians, and even if you read her writing, yes, yeah, she was, but she was a reluctant eugenicist. Meaning, because she felt so strongly about freeing women from the burden of unplanned pregnancy, but she also knew that men would not support her mission, she learned to talk the eugenics language of her day to get the financial support to do what she really wanted to do in helping women. You don't have to agree with any of this, but what you need to keep in mind is that people are much more complex than the flat, black and white, one-dimensional idea that we have of them, that this person is good and this person is evil, or this was the issue and this is the side that they were on, and so, ah, they're bad. There's more going on here than that. And you can tell when you look at her writings. Just five years before World War II, before the Holocaust, she's writing about Germany's sterilization program. I admire the courage of a government that takes a stand on sterilization of the unfit, my admiration is subject to the interpretation of the word unfit. She understood that the term unfit needed to be qualified. So here's how she qualifies it. If by unfit is meant the physical or mental defects of a human being, then that is an admirable gesture. But if unfit refers to race or religion, then that is another matter, which I frankly deplore. Now, you might find a lot of what she says deplorable itself, but it's interesting that she finds deplorable some of the same things that you might. For instance, her views on abortion are not what many think. When she mentions abortion, it's almost always mentioned in the same sentence with infanticide and child abandonment. It seems for Sanger, there are degrees of social woes and things that are worse than other things. She sees child abandonment and infanticide killing a child after it's born as the worst things that can be done, but things that are always being done when she looks around the world. So she thinks in terms of solutions. If infanticide and child abandonment are unacceptable, then the next level of options is abortion. But even that she sees as barbaric. And so she comes to her solution, give women birth control, and we won't have to deal with abortion, infanticide, or child abandonment. That's what her life mission was. That's why Planned Parenthood was not focusing on abortion during her lifetime. You don't see the rise of that until after the sexual revolution. You often hear people say things like, you ever wonder why all their, or so many of their Planned Parenthood um, clinics are in the inner city. But it's like, okay, if that explains their racism, what explains why they have clinics in places that are not inner city? What explains why they have clinics, you know, in rural areas? Why do they have so many in the inner cities? For the same reason you find more McDonald's and more uh, targets in the inner city. There's more people. And think about what the, the mission of the organization is. It's freeing women, in their mind, from slavery to being pregnant when they didn't plan it and the poverty that ensues when you plan poorly. And you don't have to like that, but you also don't have to lie about why, why it is that they're in the inner city. Uh, you have to come up with a better a better argument for that. If you want to do more than just get history from memes or have people with agendas tell you what you should believe about your opponents, there's a very cheap book of her collective writings if you care to know and understand 
your opponent in this debate. My main issue is if you're going to argue against someone, don't use ad hominem and on top of that, false information to state your case because what it does is it makes it seem like you really don't have a case at all, at least not a case that's strong enough to stand on its own merits. So agree with me or not, this is Chestnut Checkers. Remember, it's not a game. Or is it? Corrupting our sons, quick to get with your daughters. They get in, watch that set in quicker than rigor mortis. 2019, that was cars and clothes. Lying out the ball, robbing and killing and hoes. Then 2020 took Kobe and gave us COVID. Nobody dressing fly now, cars ain't going nowhere. The only thing that mattered when the city shut down was faith and health and having family around. Now that this thing is over and we back out in the breeze, I ain't trying to hear them spitting unless they rapping about these. Say cheese.